I'm feeling so small I'm standing here weeping Oh, as I'm coming clean Of the secrets I'm keeping And I've caused so much pain To the ones I love the most And I'm falling apart As I carry my heart To them I am completely surrendering I'm finally giving you everything Cause you're my redeemer, I run to the cross Because you are more than enough, Lord, completely Cause I'm yours
Come on, church. Just praise Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we magnify You. Hallelujah. God, we thank You for all You've done for who You are. And that Your Son not only was crucified, but is risen. He is alive, interceding for us today. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Just, just give Him praise. We thank You, God. Thank You, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. echo happy mother's day to the to the mothers who who are and and will be and and uh we we appreciate you i know i certainly appreciate mom before i get started today and and i just felt it very appropriate after after i sat down and talked with this young lady and and saw some of the stuff that was going on and what they're trying to do here on the gulf coast i thought it was very appropriate for today to bring in Miss Kimberly Mercer and have her talk to you a little bit just about something that, that um, she, along with some others, are trying to get started here on the Gulf Coast. And it has to do with, with our kids and, and the schools and all that. So, Kimberly, if you don't mind. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me today. Thank you, pastors, very much. I appreciate the support that you've given me. I'm trying not to get emotional for you all. That was really powerful worship, and I appreciate that very much. It was something that relates to me and my husband a lot. And um, I wasn't going to get into my testimony, but I feel that I need to just touch on that for a moment. My family's here in the front row, and I've never seen them in church, so. But I wasn't going to. But thank you, and I'm so glad to be here today. My son's in the kids church over there my youngest one I've got one of my middle ones here my other ones are all grown and out of the house with my three grandchildren uh, but my husband and I divorced eight years ago and uh, God brought us back together a year ago and it has changed my life and uh, it very much praise God so um, I want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing right now um, again I'm Kimberly Mercer and I am the first field representative for LifeWise Academy uh, here on the Gulf Coast we started in 2017 up in Ohio, and what we do is teach character education through the gospel to the public school students. And everybody is probably thinking, how do we do that? So I'm about to explain that to you. Um, on the first thing here, if we can get to the second slide, please. The why, what, and how of teaching the Bible during school. Okay. Sorry, thank you. The why, what, and how of teaching Bible during school. So I'm gonna go through that briefly with you. The next slide, please. The why? Well, students need the Word of God. Amen. We all know that God transforms our lives, and the Gospel transforms our lives, and we're living testimony of that right here, and so many of us are. Um, next slide, please. Eighty percent of the students that go to public schools right now do not attend church. That's eighty percent don't know God. They don't know their salvation. They don't know where they're going. They don't know that there's light and that there's a better life out there for them. And I can testify that, to that as well. I myself thought that this was going to be my life and that I was just destined to be miserable. And then I found God, and it changed my life. And I want these kids to have the same thing and have the same feeling that I have, and they deserve it. Next one is policies limit uh, ministry access to schools. You know, we all know that the Bible has been taken out of schools, and uh, we have found a way that we can actually help implement that and get it not necessarily into the direct classroom, but during the school day. Next slide. The what? Release time religious instruction. That's how we do it. And we call it RTRI. In 1952, the Supreme Court passed a law that said that it is constitutional as long as it was under three stipulations. Next one, please. Um, students can be released from school during the school day for religious instruction provided it is off campus, privately funded, and with parental uh, permission. So basically it would be an elective, uh, but it is during the day. So we either need to have a location that's next to a school or we will have transportation that when the bell rings. Um, next slide. An example of what we're doing here is in Van Wert, Ohio. I had the privilege of going up there three weeks ago and seeing this in person and actually seeing these third graders jumping out of their seats, wanting to answer questions about Jesus, Moses, Elijah. It was amazing the things that they knew. Um, so we renovated a school 
and that was given to us by a donation from the person who lived at the house that was right next to the school. We turned that into a classroom. That's the walkway that we, can you see that? I'm not in the, okay. That's the walkway that we paved from the house that we turned into a classroom to the elementary school. That's the entrance way right there, and on the shelf on the left, that's all the Bibles, and at the end of the year, the kids get to take those Bibles home with them as well. That's one of the classrooms right there. That was what me and Chuck got to go see. They had no idea we were coming. We popped in on them unannounced, and it was amazing. It was third graders uh, during the class that we got to see, and that is they have the 66 books of the Bible up on the wall, and that's what they were learning, and that is our newest location there. Uh, that's also in Van Wert, Ohio. And that's the middle school and the high school location. And one thing that I have that's really amazing to say is that they finally just got it in Van Wert, Ohio, that the high school kids that are attending this program there now can get college credits for it as well. So we can do that here. We can do that here. If they can do it in Ohio, we can do it here. Next one, please. So LifeWise Big Picture, this is what we stand for. Number one, we're gospel-centered. We 100% stand by the gospel. We don't change from it, and we also don't try and doctrinate, doctrinate the children. We don't teach them of any certain religion. We just teach them of the gospel, which is the most important thing. Through that, it's char uh, character-focused. We're teaching character education through the gospel, so we're telling them, like, for instance, Genesis is going to teach them about gratitude and being grateful what God has given us. We're t teaching them about being thankful, responsible, perseverance, dedication, commitment, things that our children in the society need right now. We seriously need to bring this back. Number three, local church-driven. We have to have it privately funded, so of course we have to drive it through the churches. Plug and play, that's just to let us know that really we're going to do it all. We have all the materials for it. We've already got eight schools in Ohio that have this program rolling. We have 20 more rolling out in the fall, so we can do it here. We already know what to do. For the nation, in five years, we plan on having it in 100 different schools throughout the nation. My goal here is the Gulf Coast in five years to have it in one school in at least district each district from Pascagoula over to Bay St. Louis. And then number six is excellence. You know, we're working for the king, we're representing him, and we're doing this for our children. So we strive, and I will strive, to be as excellent as I possibly can for them. Next one, please. Um, where we've been, I explained that to you, where we're going, just did that as well. So what it's going to take to get there, I need lots of prayers. My name's Kimberly Mercer. <laughs> I need lots of prayers. It's, it's a big task, and it's going to take a lot of us praying in order to make this happen and to open those doors, put down those walls that everybody has built up, and, and to open their hearts. Uh, volunteers are also going to be needed. I plan on being able to get this into a school, stepping out, and start working on another school. I, I need volunteers. I need teachers. We'll be doing background checks, things of that sort on the kids as well, or on the teachers as well. And then, of course, financial partners, because legally we have to have it privately funded. So we will need support for this. Um, student sp uh, sponsorship. So the cost of a LifeWise program is roughly $120, $120 per child per school year. So I was going to ask if we could consider this. We do have some um, pamphlets that are on the seats, and then me and my family will be out in the foyer this after, or after services if anyone would like to speak with me about it, get some more information, any questions, whatever it might be. Um, but $20 a month will sponsor two kids for an entire year, 50 will five kids for an entire year, and $100 a month would give 10 children in this program free of charge to them to learn character education through the gospel. And then that's what the cards look like for you. And um, that, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. I'm so glad and honored that I've been able to be here with you, your family, your, your congregation. Everybody is so wonderful. I've felt so welcome since the time we walked in the doors the first time. <laughs> and then we have a video for you before he steps back up. Thanks again. Seven years ago, my wife came home and she basically said this. Our school is going to start a release program that allows kids to study the Bible during school hours. And I said, no way, you can't do that. I always thought as the public school system as kind of my mission field, However, I couldn't actually spell out the gospel message to them. K-12 
kids can study the Bible during school hours. It has to meet three criteria. One, it has to be voluntary. Two, the cost has to be paid for with private dollars. Third, it has to be off school property. You meet those three criteria, any child has the opportunity to study the Bible. I just got really excited to think about all the students who could actually hear the gospel story as they're released from the public school setting into a facility like this. It's a joy to them to learn the Bible. It helps them to take it to the community, to the school, to their families. Austin came two years ago as a first grader. He went home and he said, Mom and Dad, we gotta go to church. Mom and Dad, let's go to church. They ended up coming to my church and they stayed. They've been in our church for about two and a half years now and the mom just recently got baptized and gave a great testimony and the church applauded and cheered. It just makes me feel happy that people are learning more and more about God. guys are asking questions. They're really thinking deep about some of the stuff that's going on in the world today. I don't go to church, so this is kind of my church. When I was younger, I didn't really have a thought of God and who He was, so now I have a deeper love for Him. It is so rewarding. Um, the time that you can put in, the, the money that you're willing to donate to something like this, you're changing lives. You're changing hearts. And if we're doing it here in Van Wert, Ohio, what would America look like if every church in America said we're going to go into our public school district, we are going to commit the time, the resources, the money, what would this nation look like? if we all got together and said, we're going to do this. <laughs> you see stuff like this, and oftentimes people like to bring up the, the separation of church and state and things can't be done. But how many of you realize that even the original intent with the separation of church and state was not to keep the church from imposing on the government, but it was to keep the government from imposing on the church. And I just, like I said, I, I sat and I just, I fell in love with the concept of this. And I, I just, man, down here, this is something we need. We need this. So, again, they will be available after service in the four years to give you more information uh, to collect these cards and all that. And I just, I, I encourage you to, prayerfully consider and this is not going to be a one-time thing we're going to be in contact and also if it's something you know you pray about and then a little bit down the road God lays something on your heart then just you can get with me or, or get with the church and we can we can definitely get you where you need to be <clears throat> uh, before I start I will say I, I definitely covet your prayers uh, I am still you guys may remember from last time I am still battling the the cough the the throat tickle allergy or whatever it is that has plagued me for a little while now so last time I was up here God blessed I got all the way through without any coughing spells or anything so let's just pray that can happen again uh, <clears throat> my primary scripture text today is one verse and it's part of a prayer that David prayed shortly before his death, his son Solomon was about to become king of Israel. And, and even though at this time Solomon was a, he, he was a young adult, I mean, he was no longer necessarily a child, um, as parents and, and even as spiritual leaders, I believe there's some takeaways we can take away from the, from the prayer for David's son that we can apply to, to our relationship with our kids or our grandkids or and I really want to focus on future kids, those who are 
you know, have the real young ones or don't even have kids yet. You need to pay special attention. And even within the church, the, the spiritual kids, there's plenty of kids around here that you may not be the parent or the grandparent, but they can sure use some of this stuff from you. So that's, that's how we're going to... That's how we're going to approach today. And this, this one verse is found in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. It's the 19th verse. As part of the prayer, David said, Give my son Solomon a loyal heart to keep your commandments and your testimonies and your statutes, to do all these things and to build the temple for which I have made provision. Without getting into the details of the prayer itself, the very core of the prayer, what we see is a parent who is concerned for his child. He's concerned for his child's future. You see, David knew a lot of what Solomon's future was going to hold when Solomon became king. He knew the stresses and the strains. He knew the pitfalls and temptations and and certainly the immense responsibility that was going to lay on his son's shoulder. So his prayer here is one out of sincere concern. I think we can conclude from this that David is what we would consider a good parent. Now I know this is Mother's Day, and I again, very thankful for the the mothers and and all this, but instead instead of speaking directly to or about mothers today, I wanted to use this verse, or or more the concept behind this verse, as a springboard to talk for just a few minutes to parents in general. Or again, whatever category you fall in there, but to speak of what it is to be a good parent. Now understand, first off, I am coming to you from the perspective of a parent who, along with my wonderful wife and the phenomenal mother of our children, have raised four children of our own. All four of our children are adults now. They're regular in church attendance. They're all involved in church ministry. Uh, and just so happens, they all four are here in this service today. Uh, but um, <clears throat> So I'm coming to that. But also understand this. I am also a parent who, who made... Excuse me. I'm a parent who made my fair share of mistakes. Things that if I could do it over, you bet I would. But here's the deal. We can't change the past. So wherever you are, you cannot change the past. But what you can do is commit to make today and every day a fresh start. Start where you are at each moment. <clears throat> Again, whether you're a parent, grandparent, future parent, spiritual leader, wherever you are, I believe you can get something out of this today. As I mentioned, David's prayer showed concern for his son. I believe any decent parent has concern for their children. I believe it's the dream of every parent for their child to have a better life than what they had. Most parents will tell you that when it comes to raising kids, there's plenty of angst. There's plenty of pain uh, and those tense moments. Those are, any parent will tell you that. But also, and I believe even more so, there's reward. There's joy. There's excitement. So understand, I'm going to talk for a little bit about concern for our children. but But this concern doesn't come from a point of, of worry. Our concern as good parents is is truly from loving and caring and wanting the best for our kids. And that's why a parent's concern for their children comes in many different areas. The first one I want to talk about is concern for health and physical well-being. Now if you're a parent or, or not even that, if you had good parents when you were growing up, you understand the importance of developing healthy behaviors while your children are young. A good parent will watch what their, what their child eats and drinks. They make sure you get enough vegetables and protein and not too much junk food. I mean, come on, how many of you, how many of you remember growing up, you had to clean your plate before you got dessert? 
you got to choke down the green beans before you get the ice cream. Um, it's not that your parents were being cruel. They were simply making sure you had a balanced diet. Good parents are concerned about what their kids eat. A good parent will get upset if, if at school, the school tries to pass ketchup off as a vegetable. Or at least I did. Um, so we, we're concerned about these things. We, we care about what they put in their bodies. We're also concerned about our children's safety. We teach them, or at least we try, to teach them like what, what hot means in the kitchen. Now, now some of those <clears throat> children, they have to learn it for themselves. They have to experience it. But we still try to teach them that. We, we don't let them go play in traffic. Right? We try to teach these sorts of things. We, we teach the dangers of, of smoking or other drugs. You know, we, we try to teach this stuff. And here's the thing. We have concern for their well-being, and that's a good thing. A good parent should. We need to care about these things. <clears throat> but here's the other thing. It's one thing to make sure our kids eat healthy, take care of their physical bodies. But it is so much more important to ensure the health and well-being of their soul. You see, just as the body becomes what it takes in, so the mind and the soul of a person becomes what it gets fed. And I'll just say, if, if children are not being fed a good, healthy, daily dose of Jesus, then they will probably grow up to be spiritually malnourished. In John chapter 6, when Jesus spoke to the crowd at Capernaum, uh, those who were following him after he had miraculously fed the 5,000, he said to them, beginning in verse 27, he said, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. And then down in verse 31, the crowd said to him, Our fathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then they said to him, Lord, Give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Understand right off, Jesus knows the importance of being, being fed the spiritual food. So it really comes down to this. We can feed our kids all the fruits and vegetables and proteins that we know until we, until we can ensure that they live to be 100 years old. But if we are not leading them to the bread of life, then after that 100 years, we could be guaranteeing them eternal damnation. Likewise, we can ensure the safety of our kids uh, and keep them from physical harm from the day they're born until the day they die of natural causes. But if we don't teach them right from wrong in God's eyes, if we don't teach them the way, the, 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 the truth, the life, and give them Jesus, then really all we're doing is ensuring that they're healthy when they get to hell. There are other areas of concern a good parent has. Concern for the education. Now my kids, my kids will tell you one of the first things out of my mouth whenever they came home from school was, what did you learn today? Was I just making conversation? Yeah, sometimes it seemed that way. But I was genuinely concerned that they were getting a quality education. It used to bug me when I said, I didn't learn anything. Well, why'd you go to school? I also wanted to know that my tax dollars were not being wasted, but that's neither here nor there. A lot of parents have gone to the extent of pulling their kids from public school and teaching them at home. 
And a lot of it's because of concerns of what is being taught in the public schools. Good parents want to know that their kids are being taught, are, are receiving good education. Good parents are concerned with the reading and the writing and the arithmetic. You know, if, if, if your child comes home from school and tells you that they were taught that 2 plus 2 equals 5, a good parent's going to have a problem with that. And, and they should. But I, I think a lot of the reasons some parents are pulling them out of public schools and, and homeschool is not so much the, the education, the book learning that they're getting, but it's some of the, the non-textbook stuff. You see, when my kids begin to tell me some of the things they had learned that did not line up with the Word of God, I took issue. I still remember, I still remember when my oldest came home from school one day and told us how she learned that she couldn't pray over her meal at lunch. Excuse me? No. Let's just say later on that evening that teacher received a little bit of education herself. And my daughter unlearned that. Politicians, they understand that parents are concerned with education. A lot of your political candidates try to gain votes by saying they're the education candidate. I mean, think about it. Who would not vote for the one who is, is for the kids and for the education of the kids and, and all that? <clears throat> to that I say, you as a parent, you need to know what your children are being taught. You need to know what they're getting. I appreciate, I truly appreciate that the parents of my grandchildren are very inquisitive and very concerned about everything that's being taught in school. It's not just the reading, the writing, and the arithmetic. You see, the good parent is concerned about the learning. They are concerned about the education as, as you should be. But you need to take the time to know what they're learning. You need to know who is teaching your children. It's imperative not only for their future, but honestly for the future of our nation. We need to know this. The concern for your child's education, as necessary as that is to, being, or to good parenting, it's also an even more concerning that uh, you teach them with the things of God, the knowledge of God. Again, I, I speak to myself a lot. When I was growing up, I'm just going to tell you, when I was growing up, Sunday school was no more optional than school on Monday through Friday. It was just, that's just what we did. My parents knew the value of Christian education. And I believe a lot of this carried over to how Lisa and I have raised our kids. Our kids, they haven't always liked it. They haven't always agreed with it. But they didn't miss church. Their coaches, their band directors, their school teachers... They understood our kids weren't missing church. Church took prior, priority over school and any extracurricular activities. Now, let, let me put it this way. It is not that the schooling is not important and that extracurricular activities are not important. They're very important. As a matter of fact, one of mine can tell you a story about how when he decided to play a sport and, and wanted to quit, no, we would not let him quit. He made a commitment. He's going to play. It was, it was important. We had to teach them that. But more than that was teaching them the importance and the priority of God in their life. And that's, that's what it came down to. We wanted them to understand the things of God were more important than anything this temporal life had to offer. And not only that, I... I made sure I knew what was being taught even at church. Understand, guys, just because it's church doesn't necessarily mean it's right. You, parents in here, and, and, and if you have kids that are in children's church or come to the youth, you need to be aware of what's being taught. You, you need to because ultimately, spiritually, they are your responsibility. Now, a lot of times growing up, I was the teacher for my kids, for their kids' groups and all that. But even when I wasn't, I made sure that I knew what was being taught. See, it's crucial that our children grow in knowledge and understanding of God. 
as Moses was, was relaying the words of God to the Israelites before they crossed into the promised land, hear what he said in Deuteronomy chapter 6. He said, These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And then, look, our go-to scripture, Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Amen. This does not mean make sure they get the best education money can buy. It doesn't mean that, that we should teach them the best trade or teach them the best computer skills or whatever. And again, yes, a good parent is going to do that. A good parent wants a great education for their children. They want to make sure they've set them up for future success on this earth. But what King Solomon was talking about here, the, the, the wise advice he was given was godly training. And guys, that training is primarily the responsibility of the parent. Don't leave, listen to me, don't leave the biblical education of your children up to someone else. I, I, a lot of people don't realize it, but it is not the responsibility of the Sunday school teacher and certainly not the youth pastor to teach your kids everything they should know about God. Our job, our calling, if you will, is, is really to reiterate what they should have learned at home. We should be in partnership with the parent when it comes to teaching things. Maybe we'll use a different method or a different technique or something like that to, to do the same thing, but the, the message should be a, a reiteration of what the good parent has already given them. So I encourage you, look for opportunities to talk. Look for you, that you're... Your child will get more out of a, a conversation with you riding in the car on their way to school or on their way to the ball field. They'll get more out of that conversation than they will out of a year's worth of Sunday sermons. You need to take advantage of those opportunities. Now, as vital as it is that our children receive a good education so they can see it, and it, it is. Please understand, I am not taking away from the need for a quality education and, and raising the kids and making sure they're learning their, their uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic. But even more critical is that they're educated in the things of God. Amen? Yes. Amen. Another area the good parents concerned is in the area of their friends and influences. You see, good parents are concerned about who their kids hang out with. I, I go back to my kids. That seems to be where I have the most experience. Um, my kids were growing up. They did not spend a lot of time with friends and certainly didn't spend the night at someone's house until we met the parents. I wanted to know. I wanted to know what kind of home that, that child was coming from. I wanted to know that they were, of course, well-behaved and well-mannered, but I wanted to know that they had at least decent morals. I wanted to know who, because again, the younger they are, the easy the influence. You know, a lot of us want to say, well, my kid is the influencer. We might get into that in a minute. But the, the point is, we wanted to know. I did not want them hanging around bad influences. 1 Corinthians Paul tells us, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. I don't care how good your kid is. And I'll tell you, I think I have some pretty good ones. Evil company corrupts good habits. As a parent, listen. You can say all the right things. You can do the right things. You can go the right places. You can put your kid in the right environment. You can do all the right things. But understand this. Eventually, they're going to spend more time with other people than they do with you. The older they get, when they become teenagers and all this, they're going to spend more time with others. I believe a good parent will always be involved in their child's social life. Now, I'm not, say, I, I'm not talking about the, 
helicopter parents is what they're called, where you're hovered over every little thing that they do and all this, but you need to be involved. Whether it's social media or whether it's just the friends they hang out with, you need to know. You need to be involved. There's an old adage that says, show me your friends and I will show you your future. Another version of that, show me the five people that you're closest to and I will show you who you will be in five years. Numerous studies have been done that show that people in general, people are the average of the five people closest to them. That's who we become. The point is this. Your children will become most like the people they spend the most time with. And there's nothing you can do to change that. That's why, that's why a parent is concerned about who influences their children. And it's not just the friends and all. It's, it's the influences from TV, from movies, from the music they listen to, from the video games they play. These are all influences. These are all things that, that come in. Anything that enters the body through the portals of the eyes and the ears, it goes to the mind. It becomes, it becomes thoughts. And what we think about the most is also a strong determinant in the person we become. <laughs> The ancient Chinese philosopher put it this way. Watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. The wisdom of Proverbs put it, puts it like this in the 23rd chapter. It says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. I like what the Apostle Paul said about our thought process in Romans chapter 12, the second verse, when he said, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will. <clears throat> that renewing of the mind, to me, that's our thought process. And unless your children are taking in the things of God on a regular basis, more than the evil that the world offers. Unless that's happening, we really have a hard time expecting that transformation to take place. A good parent is concerned with what, their music, what music their children listen to, what they read, what they see. A good parent chooses godly influences in their child's life. And, and, and you heard that correctly. The parent chooses don't even get me started on the, the teenagers who are allowed to make all their decisions. I will, a, a good parent will, will certainly aid in those choices. Anyway, quickly, let me, let me move on to another concern good parents have, and it has to do with the habits that, that are formed. Again, a, a good parent will try, or at least try, to help their child get in the bed early at night so they can develop good sleep habits. Uh, we, we teach them to, to take baths and brush their teeth regularly and, and, and we teach them the importance of using deodorant. And Let me just stop right there a minute. <laughs> Parents, as the youth pastor, I sometimes take the youth on trips in a van and sometimes we're in that enclosed space for hours. Please, teach, teach the importance of deodorant. And, and good hygiene in general, okay? Anyway, that's, that was free. Good parents encourage and help their kids develop good study habits. A good parent will monitor and limit the time that their children spend with the electronic devices or the video games or the, or the screen time and social media and all this. A good, again, a good parent is going to be involved in their child's life. Encourage your kids to use their imaginations. You want some time afterwards, talk to my kids about that. Talk about them getting locked out of the house. But um, I, I don't have that much time right now. All of this that I'm talking about, these are, great, these are great parenting techniques, and good parents should do this. Good parenting requires that we make wise choices for our kids until they are 
completely able to make those choices on their own. And, and if we've done, a, if we've done a, a decent job of it, then prayerfully they'll make the right choices. But here's the deal. The good parent is also going to ensure their child develops spiritual habits, spiritual disciplines. You see, early in life, the good parents are going to teach this to the kids. Again, I'll, I'll use mine as an example again. They're all here. I can talk about them. I'm not talking about them behind their back. Even before they turned a year old, they knew they did not eat unless they said their prayer. They prayed over the meal. We taught them to say prayers before going to bed. Now, I, I know here's the thing. Those, those types of prayers that now I lay me down to sleep, God is great, God is good, that's, that's routine and that's mundane. And it, does, that power, does that prayer really have power and all that? Let me tell you what has power. Routine. Routine. You teach the routine so that it becomes habit. And as you do that, you teach the power of prayer. You teach the power uh, that's behind Bible reading. T teach your kids to fast. Let them understand, no, you're not missing supper because you were bad. Hopefully. But, but teach them that. And, and, and something else. Daily devotions. I stand before you right now and say this is an area I failed in as a parent. It, you know, we would try, we'd set something up, but I just, I, I wasn't great. We would have our, you know, we'd probably go through a week at a time. Oh, we're doing our family devotion. I, I failed. I don't know what else to say. But it's important. It's important to, to plant that. All these spiritual disciplines, help them with it. Any habits that you teach your kids are going to follow them. Again, they may not always make the right choices. They may not always do the right things. But it sure beats letting them develop bad habits on their own. And then finally, and this is, this is a huge area of concern for good parents. And that is concern for the future. A lot of good parents will, will set money aside for their, for their child's education later on in life. Even when the, when the child's born or even before they're born, a lot of times they start putting this college fund up. And they, they do this. They, they set that up. A lot of times a good parent will, will help the child get their first job or their first car. Sometimes even their first house and all this. We, we, we try to help them set up a budget so that when they get out on their own, they can manage their own money and do these. And, and we... We want the kids, we want them to get a good job and a good career. So the good parent is concerned about that and does all they can to help. We get involved even when they're considering who to marry. We should. That's a big deal. We want them to make a wise choice. We want safety and security for their future while they're here on this earth. Even after we're long gone, we want to know that they're, they're set up okay. And this is a good thing. This is, this is biblical. First Timothy 1 Timothy chapter 5, the 8th verse says, If anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And then I go back to Proverbs chapter 13. A good man leaves an inheritance, this doesn't even say not even his children, to his children's children. So biblically, we need to be concerned about their future. Just as David did, any good parent has genuine concern for the kid's future, even after the parent is dead and gone. But here's the question. What about when the child is dead and gone? You see, more important than their future and success on this earth is their eternity. A good parent is going to be more concerned about their kid's relationship with God than they are about what kind of job they get, or what kind of education, and what kind of career. But too often, and I've seen this too many times in my life, parents spend most of their time and energy preparing their children for their earthly future. Come on, get good grades, work hard, take care of your body. Matthew chapter 16, the 26th verse. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? 
Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? I want to do something. I, I, I hope I'm not doing harm to God's word. If for the sake of today's message, I present this verse to you just a little bit differently. What profit is it to parents if they help their children gain the whole world but allow them to lose their soul? Or what will a parent give in exchange for their child's soul? Kind of brings it home a little bit, huh? Listen, whether you're, whether you're raising a family now or, or whether you will be someday in the future or, or whatever, you might be sitting here saying, you, you may be the one saying, yeah, I've, I've made some mistakes and I need to make some changes. Or you might be saying, well, I haven't even got started yet, but I want to get started out right. I want to be this good parent. While the musicians come, if you don't mind, I want to share with you three practical things, very practical, that you can do to help ensure that you're the parent that God has called you to do. And this is where I, I open it up. Yeah, I'm speaking to parents and I'm speaking to future parents, but this is where I really want to open up to the church because, again, we, we, have, we have young people in here and we'll continue to have whose, whose parents don't come to church. You know, we, bring, we, we get some that come on Wednesday nights that, you know, that's the only time they come. And, and you know, maybe you'll have a chance to hang out with them. But we, we have some. So this is, when I give this practical, I want to understand this is, this is for everybody. The first thing, the first thing we can do is simply pray. You see, here's the thing with prayer. Prayer brings us closer to God. The closer our relationship is to God then the more we will be concerned with our kids' relationship with God. And so then the more concerned we are with their relationship to God, the more that we will do everything we can to put them in a position to grow closer to God. So pray. Pray for your kids. Pray for their future. Pray for the kids here in the church and, and the kids in the community. Praying for our kids is... It's so vital to their spiritual development. They're not just going to stumble into a relationship with God. They need to be steered that way. And here's the other thing. Don't just pray for them, but this is a big one. Let your kids know you pray for them. Let them know that. It's going to show, it's going to show the depth of love that you have. It's going to show them that you really, really care I look back I look back on my teenage years my, my mom's in the room right now and she can attest that I was probably not the perfect teenager um, I, I wasn't as bad as some I'll just put it out there but I, I I was not perfect but I believe I believe it was the prayers of my parents that saved me from making some of the decisions, some of the choices that my friends were making. Some of them made choices a little bit worse than what I did. As bad as mine were, I really believe it was because of the prayers from my parents that kept me from falling into some of these other stuff. And it's a privilege to me. It's a privilege to me to know that my mom still prays for me today. Listen, parents. It's not going to be cool for your kids to know that you're praying for them. It wasn't for me. I didn't appreciate it at the time. I'm just being honest. Sometimes I was like, stop praying for me. I really want to do this. It's not going to be cool, but let me tell you. Later on, later on, they're going to look back. If you let them know you're praying and sincere and all that, they're going to look back with a sincere thank you. Next to prayer, the next most important thing that you can do for your children is be an example. Children watch. You're not going to get anything past a kid. They notice everything. They don't forget. They're observant. I mean, that's, 
That's how they learn. They watch us. More than they listen to us, they watch us. They know. Oh, they know when our actions don't line up with our words. No matter how much we try to hide it, they know. Kids learn their value system by watching the adults closest to them. Whether it's the parents at home, whether it's the adults in the church, they learn their value system by observing how we spend our time. Kids know if our commitment to God is real or if it's just a Sunday morning show. You can't lie to kids. Not only do they watch you, they imitate you. You see, after they've sufficiently observed your behavior, they're going to imitate. They're going to do whatever you do. All right? Now, sometimes this is a good thing. That's why some of the toys that are out there, like the, the toy vacuums and the toy kitchens and the toy tractors, is so that they can, they can learn and watch what mommy and daddy are doing. And, and okay, they're, they're cleaning, so I get to help clean and all that. So sometimes the, the imitation is, is good. <clears throat> Problem occurs when they imitate the behaviors that we would rather they not. There have been uh, many a parent, sad to say myself included, been embarrassed in public when the child imitates what they saw at home. What's done privately will be imitated publicly. <laughs> There's a story that goes something to this effect. You've probably heard it. A young boy asked his father, Daddy, what's a Christian? And the daddy replied, A Christian is a person who loves and obeys God. He loves his friends, loves his neighbors, and even loves his enemies. He's kind and gentle, and he prays a lot. He looks forward to going to heaven and, and thinks that knowing God is better than anything on earth. That, my son, is a Christian. The boy then asked, Daddy, have I ever seen a Christian? Our children don't need a definition of Christianity. They need an example. Before we tell them about God, we need to make sure we know God. They need us to model it in our behaviors, in our disciplines, in our attitudes, and how we interact. You see, when they see how important our relationship with God is, then it's so much easier for them on their own, with their own value system, to learn to value that relationship. The last piece of practical advice that I want to offer this morning is simply this. Get involved. Get involved. We do this in two primary ways. The first thing is just talk to them. Just talk. Just talk. Talk about life. Talk about stuff. Just talk. But, but notice I said talk to them you see a lot of the problem and again guilty a lot of the problem is we talk at our kids we have something to say and they need to hear it end of discussion but conversation works both ways talk to them listen to your kids listen to their hurts listen to their dreams listen to their imaginations their fantasies Listen, genuinely listen. Don't, don't sit and listen and try to formulate what you're going to say next. Uh, you, know, don't, you know, don't sit, man, how long is this going to go? I really need to go fishing. Talk to them. Get on their level and start early. If you don't spend time talking to, not at, talking to your children when they're young, then don't be shocked and surprised when they get older if they don't really want to talk to you. Don't wonder why the teenager won't come to you with their problems and their issues. Again, I'm talking here a lot of the future parents, the ones who have the young kids or are going to have kids someday. This is something you need to know. Start young. Start young. You start now, even when they're in the womb. 
you start now developing what type of teenager they're going to be, what type of adult they're going to be. Talk about God. We've already stressed the importance of teaching the kids about God, but why not just as part of everyday conversation, just bring God into your everyday life. Look, parents, I'm just going to tell you, if God is not already part of your everyday life, then you're going to have a problem raising godly kids anyway. So he's got to be, it, just, it can't be, oh, this is Sunday, let's put our religious face on. Talk to them about God. Bring God into everyday situations. Okay, so talk to them. And then the next one, as far as getting involved, be there. Just show up. When they have something going on, if it is at all within your power, be there. The, the recital, the sports game, the, 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 you know, whatever it is, the spelling bee, what, whatever is going on, whatever it is that's important to them, be there if you can. I read something, and this I, I just read this yesterday, and it's just like, wow. Bruce Arians, the coach of the Super Bowl champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers, he had this to say, and he was talking about his coaches and stuff, but he had this to say about parenting. He said, for our coaches, I tell them, if you miss a recital or a football game or a basketball game, I will fire you. He said, you can always come back to work, but your kids are not going to be there forever. They're going to grow up and be gone. When your kids truly know how much you care, it becomes easier for them to trust you. It becomes easier for them, like I said, to value what you value, to follow in your footsteps. It becomes easier to respect you. And... Honestly, I like to think that how we relate to our children gives them an example of how they view their Heavenly Father relating to them. So the question is, will they view God as a loving, caring Father who's always there for them? Or will they view God as detached and disinterested? I know this is not easy today and it's probably not what you expected on Mother's Day. But the bottom line is, our kids need us. They need us. Stand with me if you will. We don't have forever when it comes to raising kids. One day they will grow up, be on their own. And then all we've got is what was past. We cannot change the past. Many of us in here have, if, if we have kids, we have grown kids. They're grown and out of the house. That doesn't mean this doesn't apply. That doesn't mean, oh, that's it, I quit. Like I told you, my mom still prays for me. I'm sure my mom still worries about me some too. A couple more things I want to leave you with. Tim Kimmel is the executive director of Family Matters. He's a sought-after speaker, is a conference leader for, godly, for instruction in godly parenting. He's a well-known Christian author of many books, including one entitled Grace-Based Parenting. But Tim does most of his writing at a roll-top desk. And on top of the desk, he has three pictures. He has three pictures. On the far left, he's got a picture of Jameson Memorial Hospital. That's the hospital where he was born. On the far right, he's got a picture of Graceland Cemetery. He says that's the cemetery where he wants to be and will most likely be buried in when he's gone. And in the very center, he's got a picture of his wife and kids. And he says it reminds him, every time he sits down there, it reminds him where life begins, where it ends, and what really matters in between. I've heard people say, I'm not going to force my kids to go to church. It's just going to make them resent it later on in life. I just tell you, that's the most nonsense. That is, the, that is such a cop-out. I, I, hope, I hope that's not you. If I just stepped on your toes, move your feet. Um, sorry. If you value church attendance, if you treat church attendance as a positive thing, not a, oh, we've got to go, but if you treat it as something that means something to you, you don't have to worry about it later on. I mean, that's just, again, experience speaking. I'm just going to tell you, my parents, 
They made me go to church. I was the, I was the middle of, of three boys. I older brother, younger brother. They made us go. It didn't matter. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Man, if there were revival services going on, sometimes we went for two weeks every night. It didn't matter if it was a school night. It didn't matter. If we didn't get our homework done, guess what? It was waiting on us when we got home from church. They made us go. Today, all three of us are ministers of the gospel. All three serving in churches and, and, and looking for opportunities to minister and all that. And to that I say, Mom, how dare you make us go? How could you be so mean to us? I go back to Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. Isaiah tells us that God's word does not return void. So does that mean that if you as a parent do everything correctly, you know, speaking to you with young kids and the future parents, does that mean if you do everything correctly that automatically your kids are going to turn out and be, be the perfect Christian and the next Billy Graham and all that? No. No. Everyone chooses whether or not they accept Christ on their own. So it doesn't guarantee that they're going to make a commitment. But it does guarantee that His truth will not depart from them. He is going to, he's going to, to, through his Holy Spirit, be on that life. It's going to be there. It makes it a whole lot easier for them to make the right choice and do the right things. It starts at home. It continues here in the church. So my question, and, and I'm going to end with this. I, I intentionally, I, I, I thought about it. I intentionally said I'm not going to call anyone up front. I'm not, I'm, I'm not doing that. I leave you with this question. Will you commit? Will you commit? Whether you're a parent or not, it doesn't matter because like I said, there's plenty of, plenty of kids that need this. Will you commit to pray? Will you commit to be an example when they're around you here at the church or whatever? And when you, will you commit to, as best you can, getting involved in the lives of of some of these so that they can see what needs to be and that's that's it that's the questions will you commit to that bow your heads Heavenly Father I first off I thank you God I thank you for the for the godly parents that you gave me I thank you for that I, I thank you for the for the many blessings that my life has had because of that but Lord, I also understand that not everyone who's in here right now was raised in church. Not everyone who is in here had godly examples. But God, I thank you that somewhere along the line, you put someone in their life, someone to steer them, someone to be an example, someone to help them so that they are here today. So God, I thank you for that. I thank you that you don't take your hand off of us, regardless of the age. I thank you. But Lord, I also ask that you help each and every one of us from this moment on, wherever we are, parents or not, future parents, doesn't matter, wherever we are, God, that you would help us to be who you have called us to be in the area of raising godly kids. Understanding it's, it's more than just the future of this nation, although that's important. But God, this is eternity for each and every one of these young people. Help us to draw them to you and not be that one which deters them or sends them away. Help each and every one of us be that example. Be that leader. And I ask it in the name of your wonderful son, Jesus Christ. Amen.